Well, good morning. It's pretty weak. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I know chapel is early this week. It's going to be early for all of us. We're all in it together. But I believe that God's going to uh, work in a great way. And I believe he wants to speak uh, to us through his word this week. So I'm praying for you and that this week as we go through these uh, messages that God will use his word through the power of his spirit to transform your hearts and your lives. It's kind of an exciting morning for me because I have some special guests here with me this morning uh, that don't usually make it to chapel. My family's here with me this morning. My son Evan and my wife Laura and my daughter Lena. And uh, this is actually Lena's idea. She said that she wanted to come to chapel this morning. And so they actually went to bed earlier than normal. And uh, so I'm excited to have them here with me this morning. Question for you as we begin. Have you ever been distracted? Wait, what's that? No. All right. All right. How many of you say I get distracted really easily? All right. All right. A lot of us. And one of the times that, that almost all of us would say it's easy to get distracted is when we are what? Somebody help me out. Practicing. Yes. What, another P word. Praying. All right, I heard it. How many of you say when I pray, I get distracted? All right. You ever notice it's so easy. You start praying and then all of a sudden like a thought pops and then it's like your mind. And I'm like, wait, what was I doing? What was I praying for? I know. I, in fact, that happened to me this morning. Uh, God sort of prompted and put on my heart to pray for a good friend of mine. And, and I, was, I was praying for him. And, and I got, I think, about halfway through that prayer and I think I got distracted. It's like, wait a minute, what am I doing, right? It's easy to get distracted when you're praying. Well, I want you to know you're not alone. Uh, we're, this morning we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 and, and primarily looking at verses 14 through 21. If you have your Bible and want to uh, find that passage, we'll be there in just a, a few moments. But in that passage, uh, we're going to get to hear one of Paul's prayers. But he actually begins praying it in verse 1 of chapter 3. And then as he starts, he starts to pray and then he sort of gets distracted and he wants to remind them of something and then he sort of comes back to his prayer in, in verse 14. But we're going to have this privilege. If you were here last week with this, we, we looked at one of Paul's prayers at the end of chapter 1. He includes two of them in his letter to the church at Ephesus. If you're picking up with us this week, we've been in the book of Ephesians. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. It was a church that he loved. He had spent three years with them. And now from prison, he is writing to encourage them. He wants them to understand what it means to be in Christ. He wants them to understand the new life that they have in Christ and how it's completely different from their old life and, and how then to live out the glorious realities of the gospel. And so we're going to be looking this week at, at how Paul teaches them to live it out. But this morning we're going to look at what he prays for them. And it was really powerful to see that last week. And I think it will be powerful for us to, to do that this week. Now, as he's going to pray for them, he's going to, to really go back to all that he's taught them. He's going to say, for this reason... Right, for this reason I pray. And he's going to go back to everything that he's written so far about who they are in Christ, about their grace that God has offered them, how they, he has chosen them in him before the foundation of the world, how, by, how they've been saved by faith through grace, how they are God's masterpiece. And, and, and some sections that we don't have time to cover, but he talks about the glorious beauty that, that Jew and Gentile have been united into one people in Christ, that there's now one new man, one family that is made up of everyone who knows Christ, whether they're Jew, whether they're Gentile, black, white, whether they're poor or rich, it doesn't matter. In fact, in Galatians, Paul reminds me, he says, all the distinctions and differences that we have really don't matter because in Christ we become new creation and we become God's people, His family, His children, and we're all related to one another. And so he says, for this reason, he says, I want to pray for you. And so this morning, I want us to see three very specific things that Paul prayed for them. And, and I believe that he would pray those same things over you and I today. In fact, I've prayed these things over you this morning. And I, I want us to see this morning these beautiful things. So if you have your Bible, as we think about Ephesians 3, our word for today is experience. Our word for today is experience. Each day I'm going to give you sort of one word to summarize what we're talking about, to kind of hang our thoughts on. And so we want to look at what is Paul praying? He's going to pray for them to experience some things. So let's begin with verse 14. Verse 14. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So Paul, he, he gives them a picture of himself. 
on his knees, praying with passion. Why? Because he, he was consumed with the realities and the beauty of what had happened to him. This was very personal. If you go back, and, and I would encourage you to do this if you have time today, go back and read some of chapter 3, the earlier part, because he, he talks about how personal this is for him. Right? You remember Paul's testimony, right? He was extremely religious. He was a, a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. In fact, he was a leading teacher. Right? He knew the Old Testament scriptures in and out, but he did not believe in Jesus. He rejected Jesus as Messiah. He hated those who followed Christ. Right? He, he persecuted the church. In fact, it says in the book of Acts that, that, that Paul caused havoc in the church. Right? He, he was present when Stephen was stoned. He, he made it his mission to round up those who followed Jesus and have them imprisoned. I mean, he was a terrorist. He hated Christ. He hated Christians. But God intersected in his life with his radical grace and he encountered him on the road to Damascus. And the grace of God changed Paul's life. And he went from the greatest persecutor of the church to the greatest proponent of the message of the gospel. And he gave his life to spread the gospel all over the known world. And so for Paul, this, this was personal. Right? This, this wasn't theory. This is something he had encountered and experienced. And he prayed with passion. Now, it says that he got on his knees. And that's, that's really unusual for, for someone who comes from a Jewish heritage to, to see them down on their knees praying. That was not a normal prayer position. Jews would normally pray, and to this day, standing up. And so we want to step back and say, why, why does Paul say, that he's kneeling for them. What's going on? And, 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 and we, you know, if we, we took this the wrong way, we might say, is Paul just sort of, is, sort of, is he sort of bragging here? Like, is he, is he drawing attention to himself? In fact, I want you to consider this. Was it a humble brag? All right? Did you know that humble brag's a word? How many of you knew that humble brag was a word? All right, I didn't know it was a word until I looked it up, and it's actually listed as a word. Now, humble brag is an Austin tensibly modest or self-deprecating statement whose actual purpose is to draw attention to something of which one is proud. How many of you have ever posted a humble brag before? All right, come on, a few of you, right? Right, social media posts are usually what? Selfies, rants, or humble brags, all right? That's 90% of all social media. All right, so is Paul, is, is he sort of humble bragging here? Is, is he saying, hey, I'm down on my knees? You know, what's he doing here? In fact, let me say, did, did Paul post a, like a, a selfie to Instagram? You know, did he, did he do that? And if he did, I think he would have included these hashtags, all right? <laughs> Down on my knees, pray for Ephesus, prayer time, prison prayer, intercession, prayer is powerful. You know, is that what he was doing? No, Paul's not drawing attention to himself. What he was showing them was how passionate he was about what he was praying for them. Right, you know, in, in the Bible we see a few specific times where people got on their knees. King Solomon got on his knees when he prayed to dedicate the temple. Jesus knelt in the garden before he went to the cross. Paul knelt with the believers in Ephesus just a few years before this as he said goodbye to them and prayed over them. And so when we see kneeling in prayer, it draws our attention in to say what is about to be prayed, what is about to be said, is really, really important. So three big things. First of all, he prays that they would experience God's strength. And listen, Paul knew that the church needed God's strength. Right? That if they were going to live out the realities of the gospel, if they were going to live out those beautiful realities that we've been talking about, of who they were in Christ and their identity in Him, the fact that they were God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before and that they should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. He says if He knew that they, in order to live out those realities, they would need power, they would need strength. Right? Most of us this morning woke up realizing we needed some strength, didn't we? How many of you woke up really tired? All right. I did too. Right? And we need God's strength, but we don't just need physical strength. We need spiritual strength. And, and Paul, he, he, if you go back earlier in the chapter, Paul talked about how he had experienced God's strength and power and grace in his own life. And so now he's praying this for the church. He says, out of the glorious riches, out of the glorious riches, Verse 16, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he says, out of God's glorious riches, 
Right? Not, you know, according to. Not, not, and we, we talked about the difference between according to and out of. And so, that really, it's, just the word that it's more the idea of out of or according to. That he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. That you might have spiritual strength. What? So that Christ may dwell. That he may be at home in your heart through faith. We need spiritual strength. You cannot live out the gospel in your own power. Right? How many of you would say, I've tried? Anybody try that? Right? We try, like, hey, I'm going to be real. Man, I, I'm going I'm to do this for God and I'm going to live for God. I'm going I'm to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray every day. Right? I'm, I'm going to be faith. And we, what happens is we try to live out the gospel in our own effort, in our own strength. And if you try to live the life that Christ calls you to live, the life of following Him and of serving Him and bringing Him glory, and you try to do it in your own strength, you will fail every single time. You're not able. But the great thing is that we don't have to be able. All we have to do is realize that we're not able and to realize that God offers us His unfailing strength. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day day. Listen, we live in a dangerous world. We live in a chaotic world. And we live in a world where there, there's all kinds of opposition and that was no different for the church at Ephesus. And Paul wanted them to be able to live out their faith and to be bold for Christ and to fulfill the purpose that God had called them to. And he wanted them to do that with God's strength and God's power. And we can face the dangers and the chaos and the difficulties of this life only if we've been strengthened and are being strengthened by the power of God. And so God wants us to live with a certain sort of confidence in life. But I, I like to call it this, and I like to call it Godfidence. All right? Right, because confidence can, can, just the word confidence sometimes, it can make us go back to ourself too much. Right? We can be self-confident. God wants you to have a holy confidence that's, that's not rooted in yourself, that's not rooted in your talents or your intelligence or your good looks, right? Some of you, anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. God wants you to have a confidence that's rooted in who He is and what He's done for you and the power that He offers to you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. A verse that often gets sort of taken out of context, but I think because of that we can miss how beautiful it is. Paul says, For I can do everything. I can do all things with what? The help of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. Right, and we've all seen this verse get taken out of context, right? And, you know, sort of athletes will use it or people use it when they want to do something and, and sort of add God into the mix. But that's not what Paul was saying. He was talking about being able to be content in any situation to handle the ups and downs. Paul says, whether, whether I am full or whether I'm empty, he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me what? Strength. Right, what Paul was saying is that, he says, I've learned that whatever situation I'm in, whether it's good or bad, whether it's a comfortable situation or whether I'm in the worst situation. He says, I can handle life only because what? Christ gives me what? The strength that I need. Right? God's resources are unlimited. Paul prayed that they would be strengthened out of his glorious riches. Right? And, and we need to know, listen, that power is available to us, but we need to take a hold of it. We need to take access of it. Right? And there are things in our life that sometimes cause us to miss out on being strengthened by God's power. We don't experience it. Right? Whether we just don't know it's there and we don't access it. Right? You know, you could have all the electric outlets you wanted in a room, but if you don't what? Plug your device into it. That power will do no good. Right? If we don't take a hold of God's power, if we don't know it's there, it won't do anything. Or maybe it's sin. Right? When we have rebellion in our hearts against God, if, if we as a believer are disobeying Him in an area, we're not dealing with sin. Right? It, it, it sometimes prevents us from experiencing God's power. And we need God's power. We need God's power. Every time that we try to do it in our own strength, we'll fail. Martin Luther said what? He says, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be what? Losing. All right, he says, if you try to do it in your own power, you'll lose. So Paul prayed for the church. He says, I pray that you'd experience God's strength. And it's my prayer for you. Secondly, he prayed that they would experience his love. Experience God's love. Not just 
not just know about God's love, not just believe that God loved them, but they would experience his love. Listen to what he prayed. End of verse 17 through 19. He says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So Paul says, he says I pray that, that you would know that God loves you. And I hope every one of you here this morning, I mean that might seem like the most basic concept, but you need to know this morning that God actually loves you. Right? He loves you with a love that is deeper than you could imagine or comprehend. And he uses two words there at the end of chapter 17. Rooted and established. Rooted was an agricultural metaphor, right? We can all sort of understand the idea. He says, I, I really pray that your roots would go down deep into God's love. That you, would, that you would be grounded in His love. And that word established was an architectural term, right? So it had to do with foundation of a building. Right, so he says, I pray that you'd be rooted in love, that your foundation would be in the love of God. Right? And we know that Jesus said that, that God's love for us should be reflected in our lives and that it should be the defining characteristic of our life. That God calls us as his followers to be people who love, who love him, who love fellow believers, who love neighbors, and who love enemies. Right? We are to be people of love. But we'll never be people of love until we know that we are loved by God unconditionally, undeservedly, and unreservedly. He loves you. Um, a few, uh, it was a couple months ago, Lena, Joy, and I, right, I'm going to pick on you this morning, you came to chapel. We were walking to the garden. We have a garden across the road from our house. And I told her, I said, Lena, I love you a little bit. Do you remember that, Lena? And she looked at me. How did you look at me? Yes. <laughs> And then I said, I love you a little bit more than you know. Right? She does not understand how much I love her. And you don't understand how deeply God loves you. But Paul prayed for the church that they would grasp in just maybe a little bit deeper way God's love. He prayed, he said, that they would know how wide how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. He says to know this love that, that surpasses knowledge. Dr. Donald Barnhouse, who was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia from 1927 to 1960, famous preacher, gifted of God to, to bring God's word. And he said this, he says, love is the key to all of the fruits of the Spirit. I was going to show you uh, this picture. I didn't know they were coming, so... Uh, Anyway, we'll get through that slide. That was Father's Day. Aww. All right, we'll black that out so we're not so distracted. <laughs> love is the key to all the fruits of the Spirit. He says, joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Love long-suffering is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is God, love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. And gentleness is love's self-forgetfulness. While self-control is love holding the reins. God calls us to experience his love, to encounter that love so that we would understand and know that no matter what I face, no matter what I go through, and listen, Paul knew that, that God's love doesn't mean that he does not allow difficulty into our life. Paul was writing from prison to a church that was being persecuted, but he wanted them to know God loves you more than you can understand. He continues in verse 17. Go back to, uh, to that. He says, I pray uh, I pray that together with all of the Lord's people that you would grasp, you would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So he says, I pray that you would know this. And I, I think of it like this. It was a love that was wide enough to embrace the world. Right? For God so what? Love the world that he gave his son that whosoever believes in him should not what? Perish but have everlasting life. Right? God's love is wide enough for the world. It's long enough to last forever. Right? Love endures what? Forever. God's love has no end. A love high enough to take us to the very presence of God. Right? One day, if you know Christ, you're going to spend forever in His presence, in His glory, in His kingdom. New heaven, new earth, new creation. A love deep enough to meet us at our worst 
and lowest moments. Listen, we go through difficult moments in life. Some things that happen to us and some that we self-inflict upon ourselves. But I want you to know at your worst moment, at your lowest moment, you have not surpassed the reach of God's love. He never stops loving you. He never, ever, ever regrets choosing you. He loves you with an unending love. And Paul wanted the church to to grasp this. He, He wanted them to know this. And he wanted them to experience it together. He says, to know this, he says, together in verse 18, with all of the Lord's holy people. Listen, we we experience God's love directly from him, but we also experience it from and through each other. That God's love is something we share with one another, right? And we experience it in relationship, not just with God, but with others. The family of God is to be the community where God's love is expressed sacrificially for one another. It's one of the reasons that this place is so special. Right? This place is so special right? because God's love is present here. We, we experience that family love together. I think of Chehi as uh, heaven with cafeteria food. All right? <laughs> That's how I would describe it. Right? It's, it's like a little taste of heaven, but the food is going to be better in heaven. <laughs> Paul says we know what real love is because Christ gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our Christian brothers and sisters, right? We're to experience the love of God, not just so that we would feel something, but so that we would do something, that we would live a life of love for God and for others. And so Paul prayed for that. And then he prayed that they would experience God's fullness. Look at verse 19. Experience God's fullness. He says, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. What a prayer. That, that makes a lot of the prayers I've prayed for, for people feel pretty, pretty weak. He said, I pray that you'd be filled with the fullness to the measure, filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. What does that mean? Well, Colossians 2, 9 through 10, shine a little light on that. For in Christ, Paul says, all of the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. For he is the head over every power and every authority. Fullness means the state of being complete or whole, filled to capacity. So Paul's praying, he says, I'm praying that you'd be filled up with the fullness of God, of who he is, of his goodness, of his grace, of his glory, of his mercy, of his love, of his holiness, of all that God is. That you would be filled with the Spirit of God, with the power of God, with the presence of God. That you'd experience him the way he wants you to. And then he concludes in this powerful benediction. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And so he concludes his prayer with this this powerful benediction. And he, he says, Remember, the one to whom I'm praying this is able is able to do what? Immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. You can't fathom the power of God. He says, according to his power that is at work within us. Right? That this glorious power that God has is available to you and at work in you. And he says, the reason is for God's glory. Right? That the end result of of experiencing, right, God's strength is not just so that you can make it through the day. Experiencing his love is not just so that you would know his love and love others. Experiencing his fullness is not just so that you would know the fullness of God, but it's so that he might get the glory that he deserves. He says to him, to Jesus, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. The glory of God is the purpose for all this. Paul was passionate in his prayer for God's people. And it's my prayer for you this morning that, that you in your life and specifically while you're here, right, while God has you here in this place, that you would experience God like you've never experienced Him before. And that God would take you to a deeper understanding of who He is. And that you would know His strength. And that you would learn that His strength is sufficient. That you would know His love. That, that you would be absolutely assured that God loves you. And that you would experience the fullness of life in Him. So that you can live a life that glorifies Him. Would you bow your heads this morning? And I just want to take a moment to pray over you before we head out for our day. I just want to ask you a couple questions as we pray. Do you need strength? Do you need spiritual strength? Well, if you do, ask God. Are you rooted and grounded in His love? Maybe Maybe something in your life has really obscured 
obscured God's love for you. Maybe you've doubted His love. Maybe circumstances have caused you to do that. I want you to, to know that God's love is for you. And are you, I want you to experience His fullness. Father, I pray for all of us this morning. Father, I pray for every student, for every counselor, for every staff member, for every faculty member. Father, for all of us. Father, that we might experience you while we're here. And not so that we would just have an experience, but that we might know you in a greater way. And not just that we might know you, but that we might be prepared to live lives for your glory and for your kingdom. And Father, I pray that you would help our hearts to grasp these incredible truths. They're greater than any of us can really understand. So Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, might you unlock our minds and our hearts to understand the beauties and the truths of your word. And Father, may we not just believe it, but may we live it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.